Hi, everyone, and welcome. Like I said, my name is Ann Bennett. I'm the Executive Director of the Laurel Historical Society. And I'm very excited to have Wayne Davis with me tonight uh, to talk about the Guilford Quarry Cemetery in Howard County. And I just wanted to thank everyone for being with us tonight. And again, this is the recording uh, of the presentation. So we'll make sure that that information is available to everyone later on. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Davis, and he's going to talk to us uh, about a, be, I guess, a belated celebration for Archaeology Month. I always try to have uh, a talk in April, since that is uh, Maryland Archaeology Month. Uh, we missed it by just about a week, but uh, I think you're going to learn a lot about the historical and genealogical and archaeological research that they've been doing. So. Uh, Mr. Davis, um, please uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Anne. I appreciate it. This is great to be here and to help celebrate, uh, belatedly, Maryland Archaeology Month, a uh, real important topic. But I, I, for full disclosure, I am not an archaeologist. I'm uh, just a scientist. And, you know, our models are uh, research, write, review, uh, revise and review again. So lots of research. Um, I was a professional uh, environmental scientist and you know it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and you know one of the most important parts of research is history because you really have to know the topic that you're researching and that you're writing about. So, so hi history is, is just so critical and we're lucky enough to be in an area which has no dearth of, of history. It's all over us, you know, all around us. You could just walk anywhere and find it. And that's pretty much how we found out about the uh, cemetery in Guilford. Uh, it's just about 600 feet away from the uh, large Guilford quarry that's there. Um, we'll, we'll give you a little overview and, and just some updates on activities and where we're going with this and where we hope to go. Um, and, you know, please feel free to send Anne any uh, uh, comments or questions in a chat box and she will interrupt as needed uh, for any kind of a clarification. Uh, very happy to do that. So, um, hold on one second. Let me make sure I'm in the uh, slideshow. Is that still looking okay? Yep, it looks great. That's perfect. Okay. Um, the cemetery is actually, it's located um, near Route 32, right by the fence line between Broken Land Parkway and I-95. It's along Guilford Road. It's easily accessible. It's right in the back of this um, a little business park. It's been recorded by the county as a site number and it was originally called a slave burial site. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It, the owner of it uh, at the time was Rouse Associates. It was a quarry limited partnership. They did a lot of these uh, partnerships when they were buying up the land in Columbia and it's currently owned by Howard Research and Development Corporation. It was basically discovered by this incredible uh, African-American uh, history researcher, uh, Beulah Buckner. She wanted to, to document the African-American history in Howard County. This was uh, back in the 1980s. And she was looking at uh, some of the old schools, cemeteries and churches. And somehow she came across this cemetery, gave the information to the county. We're still not quite sure how we how she knew about this, but if it wasn't for Beulah Buckner, we, we really wouldn't know uh, anything about this. Um, and just in looking through different records, uh, my neighbor and, and fellow researcher, Jerry Eucherman, noticed um, this land plat from the county. And it had this cemetery marked really close to where the uh, quarry is. And so we started looking into this 
and this was already back in, you know, three and a half years ago. We tried to get some experts out. We contacted Adam Frackia, a University of Maryland archaeologist, and uh, a Mr. Johnny Jones with Vulcan Materials, who's a quarry expert. And we wanted to see what they thought about this. Um, they were uh, intrigued as we were, referred us to State Highway Administration and Julie Shablitsky, and she and her crew came out in, uh, in February, a couple months later, to take a look at it. Uh, we had also invited um, Preservation Howard, uh, Fred Dorsey, and historian Bessie Bordenay, and Beth Burgess with the county. So we wanted to, to get all the people involved that we could, you know, let them know about this cemetery, see what they already knew about it, you know, what, what could we learn, and, you know, what do we do about it? And, and this was, you know, what we found in, in uh, December 2017 when we first looked out there. It was actually a really cold day. Uh, that, that was awfully uh, freezing. And um, we don't know how many decades the cemetery had just been overgrown. It was likely, you know, many, many, many decades. There were two headstones that we can, you know, that we were able to see sticking out of the ground, but the briars and everything else was just, you know, a little bit too thick to, to do any real exploration. A little bit better in February, and we had State Highway Administration folks come out, some expert archaeologists, uh, particularly in cemeteries, this is what they do. Um, you know, and there, and there happen to be a, a decent number of cemeteries that occur along uh, the right of way for State Highway Administration. And so we were very happy to have them out. It was, it was a, a real gift. And, you know, they ended up helping out with a, with a cleanup. And in uh, June of 2020, a year ago, it started looking better, and um, things were getting cleared. We had volunteers out, and this is pretty much what it's it's looking like right now. Um, just in April, we had a volunteer cleanup. It went really well, and we want to keep this cemetery clear enough so we could go back and try to do research to try to find maybe there's more headstones, et cetera. So this is a little bit of, of what the cemetery looks like. And sometimes we're asked what kind of cemetery it is. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to answer that, but it's kind of, you know, started out a family cemetery and likely ended up being African-American burial site and potentially um, a third part, not quite sure. But, we estimate a little bit over 80 burials there. Um, a lot of them are just marked with granite field stones. They were aligned in rows. Um, the experts that have been out to see the site that are familiar with um, cemeteries feel that they are that there's an awful lot of African American burials there. Um, most likely enslaved peoples, um, the, the field stones, the Vinca, the facing east, those are all kind of signs um, of African American burials. And they could be associated with the quarry. They could have been enslaved quarry workers like they had in Seneca Quarry, um, some of the other areas, but we really have nothing to tie to tie that, it's, it's a thought. It's the proximity to the quarry and knowing that there's some very old quarry stones with hand drill marks used for some of the uh, headstones and footstones. So it's, it's interesting, it's, it's a work in progress. We, we found 11 stones that had engraved markings um, so far. There's 11 stones. We always hope to find more. We have birth and death dates for three, full death date for one, and partial information on others. 
They range in, from 1829 to, 19, uh, to um, 1838. So this is quite some time ago. Uh, belonging to Marlowe Carroll families and a young family. Um, the, the part of the cemetery would then be a family cemetery uh, related to the Marlowe's and Carroll's. The one thing that we have, um, you know, the one historic document that we have is an 1867 deed, which mentioned the, the cemetery, you know, had a reservation of six feet clear on the graves. It, it kind of, it talked about graves on the south side that were now on the premises, binding with present graves on the east and west sides. I, you know, there were two parts possibly, maybe three parts to that cemetery. We're not sure, because this is, uh, until about the 1980s, this was the only mention of this cemetery that we, are, we were able to find in any of the records. Currently, it's owned by Howard Research and Development Corporation. We got out there and we had a nice visit in October 2019. We had, um, Nancy Tucker on the left with HRD, and we had Austin and Patricia Plants. I know uh, Pat is on the, uh, the call here, and we always welcome any input that you might have um, at any time, Pat. Um, I think you want me to break her in, Pat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to unmute if you just wanted to say a few words or just introduce yourself. It's because there's a good reason that Pat's there. Well, maybe we'll give that another shot. I don't, I don't hear Pat. Okay. Um, yeah, well, we'll, we'll try to, um, here we go, Pat, if you want to. Oh, you can't unmute. Okay. <laughs> well, Pat, uh, feel free to type anything in the chat or question box and we'll make sure that we can uh, discuss it that way. Okay. Well, you know, Pat's ancestors, uh, Louis de Graff, owned this cemetery back in 1867. And at, at some point when we get to hear from Pat, she'll let you know that Louis de Graff and, and a few other members of the family have not yet been able to be located. Um, he died um, and they died during the ownership of this cemetery. So it's possible that they could be buried there. We are not sure, but we are going to try to, you know, continue to learn more. Um, along with this, in this picture is our, uh, our um, county council rep, uh, Christiana Rigby, and there I am holding it together on the right. Wayne, um, Pat said that they have the Bible records, but there's no location associated with it. So I guess that's okay. how she got a lot of the family information. So it's, it's a continuing mystery. And, uh, Hopefully, you know, we will be able to find some answers coming up in the, in the future. One of the interesting things that happened during this meeting was that um, uh, HRD said they'd be happy to give this land to the county. Um, they were not interested in maintaining a cemetery or any cemetery. Um, We've not heard back in any definitive way on the county's interest. There, there's, there's a lot of pros and cons, um, you know, to any kind of, a, a, of an arrangement. Um, as far as the parking lot to get there, uh, Rupert Management Company owns the parking lot uh, that gives access to the cemetery and they have been um, uh, very nice in allowing us to access uh, any time that we want to uh, to look at the cemetery, to do some work on it, and they've they've been very very helpful in 
and uh, making different arrangements for um, you know disposal of materials, etc. Okay, let me get back on there. Um, things that we call land preservation activities. Well, the spring of 2018, State Highway Administration was just fabulous in providing uh, two days of labor to help clear the site. Um, there are a lot of heavy debris and branches. It was just well, well beyond our ability to deal with anything. Um, Preservation Howard, um, under Fred Dorsey, was able to provide a small grant to uh, Robert Moscow with the Coalition to Protect Maryland Burial Site. Uh, Robert's the conservator. He's a cemetery conservator. And the herbicide application that Robert did uh, really helped to control, um, you know, to control the, these briars. The briars have really bad thorns and they really kept us from seeing a lot of the, uh, the area. Um, at the same time that he was out there in 2019, he identified trees that needed to be removed. We've had a few terrific volunteers be able to help in removing some of the trees. Um, there's still several left. Um, the trees that were removed were actually dead trees in danger of falling down. Um, so, you know, we, we had a few great cleanups, volunteer cleanups in 2019 uh, and 2020, and we did again uh, this spring. And I just really wanted to point out Tina Simmons, also with the uh, Coalition to Protect Maryland Burial Sites, and Dennis Green, who did, did some incredible volunteer efforts, um, uh, bush hogging uh, some of the vegetation, uh, just, just doing an incredible job of helping to clear, clear the land so we can then see the other stones and see what's there. Um, again, without the volunteer help that we've had, uh, you know, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere with this. And um, especially last fall, uh, Kevin Daly with um, a Turbo Hall donated a dumpster. Um, and the county was kind enough to pick up the tipping fee. Uh, so there wouldn't be a charge when the material was brought to Alfred Ridge uh, Landfill. Uh, so we, we've had an awful lot of help. I'm very grateful for that. Um, you and, know, a big uh, part of this, uh, no, go on, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, no, before you go on, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, but going back to your previous slides there, we had a question that was, uh, about how much impact do you think because of all the development nearby with all the buildings and the parking lots associated with them, uh, you know, have they been, do you think parts of the cemetery have been covered over? Have they been damaged? Um, do you have any plans to do any type of ground penetrating radar or anything like that? Any kind of ground sensitivity detection, anything like that? Okay. Uh, it's a great set of questions, several questions in there. Right, yes, I kind of threw a lot in there. <laughs> right now, it, this, is, this is a, um, it's a parcel of land that's not attached to anything. It's not useful for anything um, other than the cemetery. It's behind a retaining wall. So it's kind of an out parcel. Uh, it's not in danger itself of being part of any development. It's kind of a forgotten 0.254 acres. Um, kind of suspect, and I'll show you a slide a little later. Um, there, you know, it's it's very likely that the size of the cemetery itself was larger than 0.254 acres. Some of these stones had been buried for decades or maybe even over a hundred years. And there are many more that are likely to be, um, that are probably still out there just underneath the surface, maybe a couple inches, maybe a couple, you know, maybe a foot. Um, we, we have planned to do ground penetrating radar. I'll talk about, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little later and show you some, uh, you know, preliminary results. 
Okay, um, Wayne, Pat jumped in and asked if the granite slabs appear to be pedestals or division markers. Um, it looks like you might be getting into some of that coming up. Well, the, you know, there were some very elongated uh, slabs. They were probably five feet, you know, four or five feet long, at least a foot wide, had rough drill marks in them. I, I, I just think, I don't have any reason to believe that they were pedestals for anything. They were more likely to be just ground dividers, but I, I'm still looking for more experts to come and look at the site. I, I really need specifically experts in African American burials, um, African American cemeteries, um, you know, to look at, at that aspect of the site. So um, right now, all we can do is try to continue to look at document documentation, looking uh, at the history, seeing what we can learn from the existing stones until we have some kind of, um, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, definitive record, you know, maybe something will appear in a county commissioner's report or in a discussion from the Maryland Assembly. I, I, there's a lot of records that need to be looked through. And, um, but one of, the, one of the questions we were able to answer is whose land was it? And, you know, that gives us a really, the people that are buried there give us the best clue. And, um, you know, the very first stone that we found was Eliza Marlowe stone. And, um, she, as we later learned, was married to this guy, John Carroll. And John Carroll's brother, Zachariah Carroll. And there's another stone, the one on the left, belongs to Thomas Lemuel Carroll. And he was the son, the infant son, of the Baltimore industrialist, David Carroll. Uh, so there's, there's some interesting um, relationships there. We have family history on, on uh, Eliza and John Carroll to a degree. Um, we don't have anything about, you know, some, some of the parenting, uh, the parents of the Carroll family. This is not the same Carroll family that was Charles Carroll of Carrollton uh, up at Doe Reagan. There are a whole lot of branches of the Carroll family. And this was a, a Protestant branch of, of them. So we, we have the family history of a lot of them. We don't know anything about uh, a young woman. Thinking it's a young woman by the size of the grave was a very small one. We really don't know anything about her that we can definitively say. We have an initial, um, you know, we do know about John, his wife and his children, um, you know, and some of these others. We have a stone, M.A. Marlowe, and it was an infant, likely the child of Eliza and her second husband. And just, we have another one just M-A-M, and uh, you know, we believe it's Marlowe, but we're re really not, not sure. You know, wondered if it, it could be a, a footstone of the um, other one. So these are all things that we continue to look at. The first three we, we found in 2017. That was right off the bat that we were able to easily see these. Um, the other stones that have markings we just found a year ago. And we found those by doing little probes into the ground and, and seeing what hit. Uh, sometimes you're able to see a little bit of, the, of a stone sticking out and that just led you to look uh, a little bit further. Uh, this is the gravestone of Eliza Marlowe, originally Eliza, uh, Eliza Isaac, and then she married John Carroll. And after John Carroll's death, 
married Benjamin Marlow. Um, it's a very interesting stone to me because it starts out Eliza and then starts with an M right at the other, right there. M-A-R-L-L-O-W um, was born, and then you got the June 28th, 1802. But, you know, her first name wasn't standalone on the first line, so they were really preserving space on the stone. We have no idea who may have um, uh, carved it, but, you know, with a uh, active granite quarry and um, uh, people skilled in that, um, you know, there may have been somebody around. Um, there was also a relationship between the Carroll and Tamanis families, and the Tamanis family um, uh, did have a stone uh, carver. But we, we just, we don't know. We, we don't have any documentation. So we don't want to speculate uh, uh, too much. But, you know, we know who Eliza Carroll was, who her family was, the, her children uh, by the two different marriages. We don't know why she died, but she did die in 1838. We know she lived there on that land near very, very, you know, a, a few hundred feet away was there um, the land that they lived on that she and John Carroll lived on. She and John Carroll had two children, William Henry and Charles. When John died in 1829, she stayed there with the children on that property and then married Benjamin Marlowe and they lived there. Um, we know that they lived on that property. Um, we, have, we have some additional information um, that uh, Benjamin Marlowe was allowed to, to stay on that property, um, you know, a little bit after Eliza had died. And after Eliza had died, David Carroll became their guardian. Um, the guardian of the two children. So little little um, soap opera-ish type of a, of a story there. But, you know, fortunately, you know, we do have it. Some of this explained uh, at least who she was in a, a document on the colonial families of the U.S. One of the group of experts that we had out was Chesapeake Search Dog. It was an incredible uh, group of folks that trained dogs for search and rescue. They um, also trained dogs for recovery when rescue was no longer uh, an option. They agreed to come out and use the cemetery as a training session. It was um, really amazing to, to see. This is a, a little bit over a year ago. The dogs pick up on human scent, uh, the human remains. Those scents could be taken up in vegetation. They could be concentrated in particular areas. They can, you know, be in a bush, be in, in the ground. Um, and the dogs, they, what they do is that they go to this area of the most concentrated scent. In a cemetery like this, there were apparently so many scents that they really had to take their time and identify where the strongest scents were. Um, we were really lucky that one of the trainers was kind of looking at a stone and uh, uncovered one. Just, you know, looked at a corner of a stone and kept on um, looking. But the interesting thing with the dogs is that they picked up scent everywhere. Um, there wasn't an area of the cemetery that they 
didn't really hit. And in particular, they were jumping on top of the fence, separating the uh, cemetery from the State Highway Administration uh, right away for, for Route uh, 32. Uh, so they're certainly likely, you know, potential burials past the fence line and burials elsewhere in the cemetery. We just don't have the ability to, to determine right now. But, you know, having the dogs come out there and confirm that there was a, uh, you know, sense of human remains was very gratifying. It wasn't, you know, in our imagination, it wasn't just in our mind. There's, there were really burials there. And, um, you know, so this, this is just some information on John Carroll. Um, he was a blacksmith. He didn't have, he didn't own the land. He didn't have a deed to the land. Uh, we do have a copy of his will. And uh, when he died, the owner of the land um, um, deeded it to his two minor children based upon the work that John Carroll did as a blacksmith. Uh, the owner of the land was named John G. Proud. Um, he lived here for a while, but was mostly uh, from Baltimore. I already mentioned Thomas Lemuel Carroll. Um, his father was, was born on this land, um, and he trained at Sa Savage Mill and became uh, very successful in the cotton duck industry. Uh, founded White Hill and Woodbury. Um, you know, uh, he, he also had uh, built a church in Baltimore. Um, can't remember the name of that uh, particular piece of land, but it, it was very interesting. Uh, so he was, he was living here, obviously, when his child had died. He might have been newly married, I'm not quite sure. Um, but this was right about the time, uh, 1836, when he moved to uh, Baltimore. Zachariah Carroll. We are guessing that this is Zachariah Carroll. The uh, only markings we have is a Z, uh, X, C. Um, a Zachariah Carroll did die and. Uh, 1829, and he was mentioned in David Carroll's will as a brother. Uh, but, you know, we do need to do more research on this. We're, we're not given many clues, and we're, we're doing our best. And this is the um, M.A. Marlowe. And it was, uh, again, an infant. Uh, born in November and died in July, um, just shortly before um, the mother died, unfortunately. Um, and there's just no, no other information that we really have. So it, it, it was a bit of, of a puzzle. And, you know, we were fortunate to have a starting point with Eliza Marlowe. And, you know, the Google search leading to the document on the colonial families, learning that she had John Carroll was the first husband, Benjamin Marlowe, the second one. Using the systems, the, uh, you know, family search and ancestry to really look into them a little bit more, figure out who the children were. And, you know, really tracking down what happened to William Henry and Charles Carroll, uh, especially after their mother died. Um, we were able to find out that they, that they um, went with David Carroll, their uncle, uh, who became their guardian. A lot of this information is also, you know, contained in the uh, Maryland land records, the deeds contain a lot of clues 
as to who lived, where, when, who was related to whom, um, you know, so who signed off on the particular deed. There's a lot of good information. Um, we were able to map the meets and bounds. Uh, uh, Jody Fry has this incredible site, and she also has it now for Anne Arundel County, where she took, takes a look at the original land patent. So the more information and the deeds that you can get, uh, the better. There, there, there is an awful lot there. They kind of led us to figure out, well, you know, before Eliza Marlowe and John Carroll were there, who was there? You know, um, who, who were John Carroll's parents? Uh, what was going on? Where did they actually live? In this, in this particular area, there were two main land patents, uh, Winkipin Neck and Jones Fancy. And in Jones Fancy, we were able to trace, and Jones Fancy is the land patent exactly where this cemetery is. Winkapin Neck is adjoining it. And there were some co-ownership of people that owned both Jones Fancy and Winkapin Neck. Winkapin Neck was originally Richard Warfield. And uh, you can see as we go down here, both for Jones Fancy and Winkapin Neck, ended up being owned by Joseph Watson, and uh, who left it to a woman named Mary Holton. That was his, uh, basically his stepdaughter. So Mary Holton owned this land. This is Winkapin Neck. This is Jones Fancy. The cemetery is right about here where my cursor is. Here's Route 32 and I-95. We go and we find out more about Mary Polton, the wife of John Polton, and they owned Guilford Mill. Uh, looking at the census shows uh, Charles Carroll next to the Polton name for several of the census reports. Um, on a hunch, Jerry looked up Mary Polden's will, and lo and behold, found that there was a Charles Carroll was the son of Mary Polden. Looking at more wills, showed that Charles Carroll had a son, uh, James, and then uh, Zachariah, John, and David. Uh, there was <clears throat> a daughter, Mary. We don't know right now who Charles Carroll was married to, but the deed shows exactly where they lived. And there was a deed that shows that they lived in the corner of Winkapin Neck, which was just very, very close to the Guilford Quarry Cemetery. It's a very short walk uh, between the two. So it kind of only, you know, kind of solved a little bit of a mystery for us. And here was Guilford Mill. So we know they lived in this area and were buried here. This would have effectively been their backyard or, or playground, so to speak. I had mentioned uh, about John and Eliza's kids. Fortunately, it was a happy ending. Um, you could read the slide. They were actually, um, uh, David Carroll became their guardian. David was their uncle. And um, it's, it's all, in all likelihood, they moved to uh, Baltimore uh, and lived with David Carroll until they became of age. Um, in 1850, uh, 20, you know, just about 20 years after their father had died, the land was sold to David Carroll, who in turn sold it to someone else. Wait, so, we have a couple of questions I want to break in, if you don't mind. 
um, related, sure. to the, related to, mostly to the maps. Uh, the first question that came in was about uh, looking at the maps, uh, you know, kind of superimposed and looking at the patents. Are there any type of structures or manors uh, or houses that um, are associated with the Carroll or the Marlowe families uh, that would be close to the cemetery? That sh are they still standing? Ha do you hear any historic references for them? Um, no. We were not able to, uh, we know of no um, buildings associated with them. We, we do know that in this particular area, um, the Marlowe family, this particular Benjamin Marlowe, um, although he was related to James Marlowe, and they're out in Highland, and there, there is a building that belonged to their family out there uh, several miles away. This one, as far as we know, there wasn't um, a building. There, Jones Fancy was referred to very, very early on, um, you know, in the early 1700s as a plantation. We were never aware of a plantation house or um, anything else like that. And Winkup and Neck was owned by uh, Richard and Benjamin Warfield. They're, we believe that they had their houses on a different land patent. Um, this one was used more, more likely for hunting for the mill. Um, and, um, you know, but as far as any kind of structures, uh, we were not able to locate any and had not been able to, you know, had not seen any in the research. Okay. Um, one other question related to uh, the, the enslaved burials, uh, the people that were, um, the enslaved that were buried at these cemeteries. Is there any possibility or any evidence that shows that perhaps they were buried as part of the early tobacco plantations before the Carroll and Marlowe families, or are they associated with perhaps the quarry workers who were enslaved at, at a later period? Well, I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, because, you know, we, we were able to find the, this, the, the Marlowe and Carroll, Carroll family burials kind of in, in one spot in the cemetery. And the rest of the burials kind of in alignment in, in, the, in the main part of the, of the cemetery. But the field stones, so many of them were granite. And, so, and a whole lot of them had drill marks. And they, they weren't hydraulic drill, drill marks. There are drill marks in quarry that would have been made by hand. And, and so, you know, that would have predated 1900. The land records and the fact that there was an existing graveyard um, in 1867, um, you know, in a couple, in at least two different um, parcels, or at least two different aspects of the, of the cemetery. It, it really leads us to, to, to believe that this was somewhere between 1830s and 1860. You know, somewhere between the start of the quarry and uh, Civil War. That's the best that we can get right now. Um, we, we'd certainly like to know more, but that's, that's um, so we do believe that this was after the African American burials were put there after the uh, Marlowe and Carroll family. Um, there was a, a question about ground penetrating radar. And uh, this is uh, uh, Jim Stubbe, who is a, a professional geophysicist. This is what he does. Uh, he does ground penetrating radar. We selected this, or he selected this square area to take a look at and to see 
you know, <laughs> what what could he find? Is is there something in particular that might be under there? This is uh, Jim and his wife. Um, uh, she's a geospatial analyst, and they team up and work together. This was still when we had a little bit more debris on the site than we do now, so it wasn't the easiest to um, to work over. Um, so we, we did the GPR. Um, I, I have a little little map of that in a second. Um, and we also uh, tried to map the stones on the cemetery. So before Jim Stuvey would give us, you know, kind of a, you know, his best understanding of what could be going on, he really wanted us to map the surface features. And then he could better compare that with um, the GPR that he did. Um, so we looked at almost, uh, you know, we mapped about 500 stones that were sitting there, did an um, awful lot of recording. Uh, very grateful to uh, archaeologists Jim Gibb and Kelly Palick. Uh, Kelly's the director of uh, the Upper Patuxent Archaeology Group. So a shout out in honor of the, uh, um, you know, Maryland's Archaeology Month. And Barb Fuller is, is a, you know, a friend and, and neighbor and great worker who is very dedicated to, um, you know, to the, to the cemetery and trying to figure out who these people were. So we did, we did a great deal of effort here. Um, and this, the mapping had occurred uh, last summer. Uh, this is what some of the mapping looks like of the stones. There's, there's really nothing definitive to look at here. This is just to let you know that this information had been recorded. It had been put into, um, you know, a program that I do not have access to. Um, you know, uh, Kelly Palig from UPAG took this information and some of our notes and developed a map of what we call the fossey or the burial depressions. I have not, I don't have access to this data to go back and, and basically ground truth this and confirm um, that these were the orientations or the sizes, et cetera. I would love to get this data set and I'd love to be able to get the entire data set to provide the Jim Stuby, but it, it just isn't, uh, it isn't accessible to me right now. And uh, I don't know how much more begging and controlling I can do um, to get it, but it's uh, not been, uh, not available at the moment. Um, so what, what Jim Stuby was able to tell me was most of the burials that he saw or potential burials through the GPR were about two to six feet under the ground. Um, you know, he was getting readings, artifacts uh, there. And, you know, until we are able to put this out into a nice uh, GPS, GIS format, where, you know, which we hope we will be able to. Um, you know, I, I just, we just need the next steps. And since everybody's a volunteer, it, um, it takes a little bit longer because we greatly appreciate the volunteers that we've had. And, you know, we don't want to, you know, impose upon them. So when, when they're available and ready, we are hoping to get that information. Um, this is just, just a map, an aerial of the cemetery, um, and along with the, the plat that had been developed by the county, showing the land, looking at basically uh, duplicating these measurements here, you know, 0.254 acres, 11,000 square feet, and the lengths of these different lines. Uh, you, you can kind of see that based upon the information on the top right, 
from some of the recordings that we did of where potential burials could be. It, it probably extends into this area here um, on top. This is the fence line that goes along this area. There's likely burials outside of this flat area of the 0.254 acres. We just need more um, research. We need more time. And we need to get that mapping completed. Um, we need to figure out how to do that. Um, what I'd really like is, um, uh, we already went over that. Um, really like to get some experts in who, you know, and that's not saying that, that we haven't had really terrific experts. Um, you know, but, but maybe somebody that would be able to, to do a research effort. Um, to take a look at trying to understand why are there so many African American burials at this site? Who are they? Why are they buried there? When were they buried there? Um, and it could be that we would need to work with the appropriate organizations to be able to eventually have the landowner give permission to look at any of the burial shafts. Um, you know, you do need to have uh, a very expert archaeologist uh, specializing in African American burials to do that. We're trying to find somebody. We're, we're even trying to find somebody just to be able to talk to, to give us advice. Um, everybody is so busy with their own particular projects um, and their own commitment. It's it's been difficult. Um, I'm I'm a little surprised that we're not being you know not able to get a little bit more uh, traction from people on this. I don't know how often there could be 30, 60. Uh, African American burials of enslaved people in a cemetery in the middle of a populated area, and then nobody has a clue how they got there, who they are. Um, th there has to be answers, and there has to be people that are interested in helping us find answers. At least that's my feeling. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful. So. Um, eventually, we'd certainly love to have a nonprofit form to make sure that the cemetery is uh, maintained. And, you know, preferably, we'd love to see the county take ownership of it and actually open it up, um, have it become a little park, let people see, you know, the cemetery, the proximity to the quarry. You know, so there's, you know, open it up to the public because there's, there's no sense in hiding um, sites, hiding information. If, if we can, uh, you know, do crowdsourcing, if we can, you know, make more people aware of this, maybe somebody will come up with some answers or uh, interest. Maybe there's a dissertation out there, uh, a PhD student waiting to do some research. Uh, this would be a great area to do that. Um, so we're we're trying. Um, uh, meanwhile, I I just listed over here some some of the resources I've been using to really uh, uh, try to get a a look at this information. Fortunately, Maryland State Archives, since COVID came about, has put many more collections online. Um, uh, there's there's good information on wills, on, on probate, on a whole lot of different things from this uh, particular area. So, you know, we're going to keep on doing research. We're going to keep on um, hoping. We're going to continue to maintain it. 
We're going to continue to do volunteer efforts and soon ask uh, Kevin Daly of Turbo Hall one more time if he's able to donate a dumpster for us and ask the county if they'd also cover the disposal costs again. Um, we do think there's something special here. There's, there's, it's a puzzle. There's things that we need to answer. So um, that's all I have. I, I do appreciate you guys taking the time to listen and uh, love to hear if you have any questions or suggestions. Okay, great. Yeah, let me, why don't you stop sharing your screen for a second, Wayne, and then I'm going to try to get my video up here. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we have a couple questions. If you don't mind, we'll go through that and then uh, some comments as well, and then I'll go through uh, and talk about our announcements so I'll be able to stop the recording before we, we do that. Uh, so one of the questions uh, that came through is uh, what act, what was the specific evidence that these burials were uh, enslaved people that were buried in the cemetery? What led you to kind of start that whole research process? Um, right now, it's speculation. It is um, circumstantial. We have um, a date span. Um, you know, based, it's a best guess. So we, we have the timelines of the ownership. We have all of the deeds. We have when this was mentioned. Um, so the, the graveyard in at least two different parts was mentioned in 1867. We have field stones out there that, you know, do have the, hand drill marks in them. Uh, they weren't hydraulic, um, you know, but they were still there. That would imply something past the date that the quarry opened, um, you know, possibly late 1830s, beginning of the 1840s, um, you know, and then, you know, if you really want to want to speculate, um, it is it is always possible that there are burials there, and you know somebody, you know e even in the you know late 1800s, early 1900s, they placed stones there from the quarry. You know that that were just laying around. But we have you know we would love to have very very specific evidence. And about the only way that we're going to be able to get that, I believe, and talking with an expert in this is, is an excavation. Because right now we don't have the paperwork to, to show one way or, or the other. So it's a great question. Okay, and it looks like you might have a couple uh, volunteers uh, who are willing to help you out or at least talk with you. Uh, and we can certainly pass along their contact information uh, to you later. Uh, but Heather said that she is a history PhD candidate student uh, working at the Library of Congress. So she said she would be happy to uh, look into anything and they ha um, in terms of their electronic access to the LSU databases on that uh, she might be able to uh, connect you with uh, grad students also <laughs> who might also be interested in the issue and, and help you further so that yeah. would be wonderful <laughs> i think yeah i think very it's wonderful. great so uh, hopefully this talk tonight would be very fruitful for that so heather thank you for that comment uh and if it's okay with you we'll pass uh pass your information along uh to wayne uh from when you registered uh, and then Elaine also commented that um, her husband uh, and she own the old Worthington home and the cemetery in Dickinson. Um, does that sound familiar to you, Wayne? Do you know what she's talking about? Uh, yes, and I would love to learn about that. Okay, uh, so Elaine said that they have granite uh, in their home and the cemetery, and she wanted to know if it possibly came from the, the Guilford Quarry. So. Uh, she thought uh, maybe there would be an interesting chat between you two. Yes, I would love, you know, please share my contact information. Okay. 
I think that sounds great. So uh, I don't think there's any other unanswered questions or comments. Uh, is there, if there's any comments or questions, please feel free to uh, put them into the chat. Uh, if not, I will stop the recording and then just uh, make a few announcements. Um, but again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in while I'm doing that.